What I love about history is that you can see these constants running through it. The French will always think they are the highest of culture. Americans will always think that they are the bastion of democracy. China will always see themselves as the center of the world. The Dutch will always think they are the equal of world powers. Starting to think every country thinks they are the best. But, as you will see in this video, the Dutch trading spirit of the Dutch Golden Age is also one of these continuations. For the Frisian merchants of the early Middle Ages peddled their goods throughout the coasts of Northern Europe. In the early Middle Ages, great kingdoms formed in the Germanic cultural sphere. England had the seven major kingdoms known as the Heptarchy. Italy had the Lombard Kingdom. France had the Frankish Kingdom. Therefore, it would speak to reason that the Lowlands would have a mighty Frisian kingdom. A Magna Frisia. But this might have never existed. There are several reasons that it might or might not have existed. Remember from the last video, which all you lovely viewers have seen of course, that back in the day basically all of the lowlands were part of Frisia. Germanic society was often highly hierarchical, as seen in the previously named kingdoms. Therefore it would speak to reason that a Frisian kingdom also existed. Germanic kings often gave gifts to their subjects to ensure loyalty. This included expensive jewelry, like say a fibula. On the death of Vinam, one of these has been found. This fibula would cost a king's ransom to make. There are also stories about Frisian kings, which we will dive deeper into in a bit. But there is no concrete evidence. All evidence in favor of a Frisian kingdom is almost completely hypothetical. No remnants of a Frisian palace or king's hall has ever been found. There are gaps within the succession of kings, and even the size of this hypothetical kingdom is vague at best. So when I talk about Frisian kings, you might see them as powerful local landholders, or as warlords who act as a sort of king. So this is the evidence that supports and the evidence that denies the existence of the legendary Frisian kingdom. As I said before, there are stories about Frisian kings. Starting off with King Finn Folkvalding. He's mentioned in the Beowulf poem as the king of the Frisians. But in this video I will only focus on the three kings whose existence is supported by actual accounts from Franks and Anglo-Saxons. According to one story, guest right was very important in Frisian culture. This story is about uh, 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 look, I have no idea how to pronounce his name, so I'm going with the most Frisian pronunciation. Odd Gizel. He was the king of Friesland around the year 678. Wilfrid, the Bishop of York, had beef with the Franks. So when he was traveling to Rome in 678, he avoided the Frankish lands and traveled through Friesland. At this time, the Frisian realm included Utrecht, with at its center the settlement of Dorestad, where Odd Gizel might have resided. Here, Wilfred was allowed to stay at his court. However, due to bad weather, he was forced to stay a bit longer. When the Franks got word that he was staying here, they sent an envoy to offer gold in exchange for Wilfred. Odgizel had the letter read aloud by the envoy, then shredded the letter and proclaimed that the guest right was holy and sent the envoys on their way. The late Lord Frey might learn something from this. Alas, all good things must come to an end. Odgizel's successor was probably the best known Frisian king. His name was Redbot. He had the difficult task of defending Friesland against the Franks. Quick sidebar, the Franks had kings, but the real power holder was the mayor of the palace, a hereditary position held by the family later known as the Carolingians. This situation remained until Charlemagne, yeah, that one, his father crowned himself king. Okay, sidebar done. So when the mayor Pippin of Herstal was in power, he expanded the Frankish kingdom to include modern-day Utrecht in 690, and Redbot was forced to accept Frankish power. Pippin laid the foundations for the bishopric in Utrecht by inviting Willibrod. But more about him later. Redbot was forced to wed his daughter Teudesinda to Pippin's eldest son, Grimold. But sadly, that's all we know about this woman. When Pippin kicked the bucket, the succession was disputed with Charles Martel, yeah, that one, being the most prominent heir. Redbot used his moment of weakness, rallied an army and beat the ill-prepared forces of Charles Martel in 716 in a battle near Cologne in modern-day Germany. After the whole succession business was settled in Francia, Charles Martel returned to Frisia in 733. And in 734, King Popo made his last stand at the Battle of the Born. The battle was a decisive Frankish victory. And Popo was killed somewhere during the battle. The Frisians to the west of the river Lauers were now subjected to the Frankish king. Those who lived eastward were brought into the fold after the Saxon Wars in 804. The Franks were not the only ones interested in Frisia. 
As in 810, the Frisians were treated to the same sight that the monks of Lindisfarne got in 793, as longships filled with Viking raiders plagued the coasts of Europe in the era known as the Viking Age. The Frisians were largely defenseless against these raids. The frequent raids of Frisia is thought to have contributed to Dorestad's decline as a trade hub. However, evidence also suggests that many Frisians, still being pagan and all, actually joined the Vikings on raids in foreign lands. The Frisians also came to know a Viking ruler. Rorik of Dorestad was a Norseman who was acknowledged by the Frankish Emperor Charlemagne as ruler of Frisia from 841 to 873. Before the coming of Christianity, Friesland was pagan, like the rest of Europe was. Frisians, belonging to the Germanic culture group, roughly held the same religious traditions as other Germanic peoples. The gods the Frisians held were the very same as the rest of the Germans. The identity of these gods are closely linked to those of the Norse. The Utrecht baptismal vow mentions the following three gods, which the Frisians and Saxons might have seen as their three most important gods. Veda, Tonger and Saxnot who was often conflated with Thies. So, at the onset of the early Middle Ages, Frisia was pagan, but their southern and overseas neighbors less so. They made several attempts to convert the region as far back as 630, when the Frankish king funded a small church in the city of Utrecht. The status of Christians, however, was heavily dependent on the political situation, since it only took 20 years before the church was destroyed. When Wilfred was visiting Odd Gisel in 678, he also attempted to convert the local population. But he probably found little success, as the kings remained pagan, and as everybody knows, kings are trendsetters. One Frankish bishop came close, however. Wolfram was out preaching at the court of King Redbad, but with one foot in a baptismal font, a question popped into his head. Hey, I have a question before we continue. We? Are any of my ancestors in this heaven of yours? No, they were hidden, and they are burning in hell. So, are we doing this? They didn't do this. Redbutt would have rather spent an eternity in hell, partying with the lads, than spent an eternity in heaven with his enemies. The conversion of Friesland was a little bit unique for its time. See, most conversions were top to bottom. First, the local king would be militarily defeated and then converted. Then the king's elite would follow, and the peasantry would follow the elite's example. However, as we have seen, Redbot and Popo refused to convert and the latter even died in battle. Thanks to this, the Christian missionaries had to go town to town to convert the populace. The first steps in conversion was made after 690, when Redbot suffered his defeat, and Pippin of Herstal allowed Willibrord to build a church and cloister on top of the destroyed one, and the Pope anointed him the first bishop of Utrecht. However, Willibrord was not very successful at first. Boniface was sent to aid him, but that didn't help either. Boniface was kind of a zealot. In Germany he had gained a reputation for destroying pagan relics. It seems he wanted to apply this heavy-handed approach in Friesland as well, because in Dockham in 754 this happened. Sup party people, I'm here to baptize y'all. <coughs> Boniface was murdered. The first real progress didn't happen until the end of the 8th century, when Lyotger was at the helm. He came from a Frisian noble family and continued Willibrod's work, but found more success since he was a local and spoke the local language. It took the Franks almost 170 years to start conversion in Frisia. But in the end, it was a Frisian who was the most successful in converting other Frisians. Allow me to dial the clock back to before the Frankish conquest. As I promised you, I talk about Frisian trade. The first mention of traders from Frisia can be dated back to a story written by the Anglo-Saxon Bede. He tells a probably fictional story about a Frisian trader in the year 678 buying a slave in the English city of York. Just like the Flemish would be later, the Frisians were famous for their textiles. According to archaeological evidence, most Arabs would have woven their own textiles. Some of the excess cloth would be sold to merchants. Though it has also been suggested that Frisian cloth could mean clothing imported via Frisian merchants. This would suggest that Frisians brought in cloth that was possibly fabricated in England and they then sold it in mainland Europe. This Frisian cloth was of such a quality that when Charlemagne and the Caliph Harun al-Rashid exchanged gifts, Charlemagne would give him Spanish horses, hunting dogs and colorful Frisian cloaks. Frisian trade consisted of three main trade routes. First was the already mentioned English trade. 
The Rhine trade might have been the most important to the Frisians. Not only did they sell their cloth here, but they also imported many goods from the Rhineland. For example, wine and pottery. The last route was the Scandinavian route, where the Frisians stepped into the lucrative Viking trade. Frisian trade was so profitable that the fibula mentioned earlier had almondine gemstones that came all the way from India. Written sources also tell us of Frisian districts in several cities. Some only had marketplaces where the Frisians peddled their goods, but others had entire parts of their city inhabited by Frisians. Some places still bear street names referencing this. The best example of this is the Friesenplatz in Cologne. Frisian trade found its peak under the early Frankish rule, but this trade would gradually decline. The Frisian traders would still participate in European-wide trade until its final decline in the late Middle Ages. In the year 1000, the Count of Frisia designated four official trade cities in the modern province of Friesland. Stavern, Ljauert, Dokkum and Bolswat, complete with marketplaces and the right to mint coins. These coins have been found as far as Russia, but also coins from towns that were still considered Frisian during this period. Medenblik, Winsum, Groningen, Garolsweer, Emden and Jever. So, now Magna Frisia has been absorbed into the Frankish Empire. This was the last time that the Frisians enjoyed full independence. Join us next time when we will see the Frisians try to stave off feudalism, continue the age-old Dutch tradition of fighting the sea, and do some good old crusading. If you had a blast watching this video, then please consider leaving a like, comment, and press the subscribe button. Also, don't forget to click the bell icon if you want to get notified when the next video is uploaded. And have a good one. See you all next time.